Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the concept of attention. When we have an encoder that sends an intermediate representation to a decoder, we're sending just one element. In the algorithm of attention, we're going to send more input elements from the encoder so that the decoder can look at specific states and decide which of these hidden inputs are the ones that matter to generate the output. So what have we seen so far during the week? We had feed forward neural networks, which took an input, did some computation with a hidden layer and produced an output. We had neural networks that can transmit data across um, executions of themselves. So for example, if you have a sequence of words and you have uh, a recurrent neural network to predict the next word, like an I am, you will get the input I, you will produce the prediction output am, but you will also produ pr uh, produce a hidden vector that will go on to the next um, L, um, iteration of the recurrent neural network. This is unidirectional transmission. transmission. By the way, you can also have bidirectional transmission where um, after training, you can have contributions from the word that comes before you and the word that comes after you. So you're getting three inputs to your recurrent neural network. The input itself, an H element from the word that came before, and another H element from the one that came after, making it bidirectional. Um, so we had neural networks that can transmit across sequences, and we also had architectures that can encode a sequence into an intermediate form and then decode it into some other form. We call these encoding decoding architectures and in general they deal with sequences to sequences, like the words in a question to the words in an answer, the words in an article to the words of the summary of the article. In this video, we'll look at the concept of attention when you're producing the decoded output, maybe you want to look at more elements other than just your intermediate representation. We're going to have attention across encoder decoder. We're also going to have self attention, which is looking at my own uh, sequence when I'm encoding. And we're going to look at a couple of architectures that use this. They're called transformers. They're we're going to look at the concepts here, and then on your exercises, you're going to get to play with a few transformers. So take a look at this matrix here. Uh, here we have an English sentence. The agreement on the European Economic Area was signed in August 1992 on top, and then the French translation um, from top to bottom. L'accord sur la zone économique européenne a été signé en août 1992. What we have here is the translation, but also a matrix that tells you how much attention you're paying uh, to each element in the English sentence when you're generating the French element. So for example, when you are generating the 1992, the French element here, what are you looking for in the input? You're looking at the number 1992, of course. And this is very obvious. If you just have the sequence 1992, it's obvious that it only needs the sequence 1992 to generate something similar. However, most things in language are not so easy. When you're generating, for example, um, the word signé, signed, you do need to look at the English verb signed. But because this has agreement with the subject, if this was feminine, for example, it would have another E. You also need to pay attention at the subject. So most of, when you're generating signé, most of your attention is going to the word signed, but also a little bit of your attention is going to the word agreement. When you're generating the word uh, A, you need to pay attention to was and signed in English in order to get the correct tense in the French. So sometimes you only need to look at one element to make an input out, uh, an input in English appear as an output in French, but sometimes you need to look at more than one element to make an input in English appear as an output in French. We call this process attention. 
how does attention happen? We can get attention by transmitting richer information between the encoding and the decoding. A student. So when we were transmitting the encoding, you could transmit just an intermediate vector, but you could also transmit all of the little H hidden states that you generated when the recurrent neural network was running or when, when, your, when your LSTM was running. So all these intermediate hidden elements get transmitted to the decoder along with the last intermediate representation. And then during training, the decoder can decide which of these is better to generate the correct output. That way, it can generate a mapping to what elements it should be paying attention to when it's generating an output. For example, if it's generating the word je, I'm sorry, if it has the word je and it wants to generate the English I, it takes um, this, uh, the generation of I has all of the hidden states and it pays most of its attention to just je, because obviously je is equivalent to I. However, when you're generating the word sui, for example, you can see that most of the attention, I'm sorry, when you're generating the word am, because you, you, uh, you're translating from French to English, when you're generating the word am, you need to pay most of your attention to sui, but you need to pay some attention to je as well. And you pay no attention to étudiant. When you're generating the word a, you pay attention to sui and you pay attention to étudiant. So by transmitting a richer set of information from the encoder to the decoder, the decoder can take advantage of it and decide what are the elements that matter. If you made a huge vector with an, the weight of how much the first element is going to matter, the second, the third, and the fourth, you could uh, implement attention. And you'd also really uh, be freed from the constraint that you need to have a one-to-one -one relationship because then you'd have vectors that map the N-to-N -N relationship between uh, word and its translation. You could also have self-attention, where if you have a sequence of tokens or words, um, you could try to decide which of the words is getting the most input from other hidden states. For example, the word it in the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. The word it is paying a lot of attention to the animal, is paying little attention to cross, and it's paying a little bit of attention to street. This is because, because in, in, during its training phase, it must have seen that it had correlate, positional correlations with animal, that it had some positional correlations to street and almost no correlation to cross, for example. So this allows it, this allows the encoding to pay attention to itself and to the other elements in the sentence. In your exercises, you'll read the, about the programming implementation of self-attention, but in summary, during training, you generate a series of matrices that tell you how much attention uh, elements should be putting, uh, should be given to other elements. So for example, the word it, when you have the word it and you're inputting the it into the network so it can predict some other element, it needs to pay a lot of attention to previous nouns like robot and it should pay almost no attention to previous uh, verbs like obey, for example. So it's going to take these elements and with them generate an attention vector. So if you have the first law of robotics, a robot must obey the orders given it by a human. And you want, you have the word it, and you want to generate the next word in the first law of robotics, you're gonna have two vectors the embedding of the word it and a vector of weights of how much weight we should be giving each of the inputs in the sequence. 
and from training we'll be able to know that the word robot needs a lot of attention and that the word the needs very little attention and by the way attention just means the embedding for the word robot multiplied by an attenuating factor by 50 percent for example plus the embedding for the word obey multiplied by 0 0.1 plus the embedding for the word orders multiplied by 0 0.05 so you're going to get a combination of these embeddings which give you the elements that you should be paying attention to which is going to look a lot like robot plus the embedding for the word it the input and the attention and this gives you really cool uh, information really cool performance improvements for example if you are standing on the word chasing you can analyze the attention vector and see that it's paying attention to things like is and fbi for example you can also do this with multimodal attention if you have the encoding if you're encoding a picture like the color picture here on the left upper left if you're encoding a picture and decoding the description of the picture like a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park then you will get a vector of the encoding of the hidden uh, information of the encoding plus the final intermediate uh, state and as you decode that into english words you'll know which parts of the encoded input meaning which pixels it was paying attention to so for example when it generates the word frisbee here it's paying a lot of attention to the pixels that have to do with the frisbee Uh, again, in your exercises, you will see more about how this is generated. But uh, what this is really uh, good for is that it allows us for more complex architectures. What we have here is a transformer. A transformer is a kind of encoding decoding where you have a half here that's encoding and another half here that's decoding. And by the way, when it, has, it says NX, it means that it can have multiple levels of these. And by multiple, I mean dozens. Um, it has, for example, if you want to input the word je and have it uh, come out as the word I, it will take the embedding of the word je in French. It will correct it by a positional encoding, telling you how important the word je is if it comes in the first position. It will send this to an attention head, which tells you how important every other word in the input is to je. Then it will use a neural network to generate the correct kind of intermediate representation. It will take that and take as the, as the start of the output, like a token for new phrase. So it takes the new phrase from here, the... Uh, intermediate representation of something like je into here it enters into even more attention heads which get the information from attention from the encoding face ultimately produces a softmax vector with like the thousands of words that it has and the one with the bigger probability is going to be i <laughs> so je attention uh, intermediate form generation it goes into the attention softmax and the output i that's a transformer it's um a complex model but very powerful in what it can do there's two types there's many types of transformers many i'm just going to focus on two that are particularly important BERTs and gpt2s and inter interestingly they've discovered that you only really need half of the transformer you can use only the encoder as in BERT or only the decoder as in gpt2 a BERT, for example, or a bidirectional encoder representation is um, an algorithm that takes the inputs that you're going to encode and produces a vector, some representation of them. What do we want this for? The cardinal use of a BERT is to predict words, to function as a language model. So, for example, if you give it an input like, I want to mask, the car because it is cheap uh, the bird uh, a bird will produce the output by because it'll give it'll receive the embedding of all of the words it'll pay attention to the fact that the input had car want cheap and will produce a vector for the mask that has all of that attention information and it tells you that the correct candidate 
for those attention words should be by. And by the way, this is going to be in your exercises. Uh, just how uh, to look at a bird generating this output. And by the way, it does this again with 340 million parameters. So none of these are light models to generate or run. What's really cool about the bird is that once it generates that vector, you can do a lot of things with it. You can, for example, fine tune a bird so that if you get an input and generate a vector, you can use that vector for classification. So you can use it to decide if an email is spam or not. You can use it to define to see if a movie review is positive or negative. Here, for example, we would get the words of an email and we would have a token uh, CLS for classifier. This token will take all of the attention information from the other words in the email. And then we will train an additional neural network to decide if this classification vector is spam or not spam. And this is what makes BERT, BERT really powerful. It can be fine-tuned to many tasks. Uh, for example, uh, QNLI is about language inference. So it, if you give it two sentences, it can tell you whether one can be inferred from the other, for example, or whether one is the answer to another one to the question. If this is a question, this is an answer, it will tell you yes or no. Uh, you can use it for sentiment analysis, tell you if something is positive or negative. You can use it for uh, question answering tasks. This is what Squad does. You give it a bunch of questions and paragraphs where the answers are, and it'll give you the positions where the answer starts and ends. Uh, Bird can also be used to find named entities or proper names, and it will tell you where they start and when, where they end. So they can be adjusted for many tasks, and they are very powerful. A different type of transformer is the GPT-2. It only uses the decoder part. It is very good at generating predictions of what the next word will be. So if you give it planet, it will generate the next word. Uh, for example, here, if you give it spaceship entered orbit around the planet, it will then give you something like once in orbit and so forth. Um, you can, again, experiment with the transformer there. And it's 40 gigabytes and it's 1.5 billion parameters in order to generate all these. It has multiple attention heads. It has numerous faces of this. So it is a very heavy model. As a summary, we have an, a, an idea called attention, which is that you can pass information about all of the elements into supplementary vectors or matrices so that when you are decoding, you could take advantage of all that information and essentially establish end-to-end -end relationships, telling you, oh, if I'm looking at the verb, if I want to generate the verb signé, I have to look at the word signed, but also the subject agreement. Um, you, use, you can do this across encoding decoding stages, but also you can use self-attention to look at your own uh, items in the encoding. This has been used in architectures uh, that are called transformers. BERT and GVD2 are just two examples on them. And they can use this property of paying attention to multiple parts of the input to generate really powerful and flexible output. But all of this comes at a price, which we will analyze in the next and final video for the week.